It's been pretty amazing to be kind of at the at the forefront, at the cutting edge, to see all the uh, the luminaries in the field, and you find out that these these big names are just uh, people um, with a lot of common interests that overlap with yours, and who were only be too happy to talk with you about them. Hi everyone. The talk today is going to be on building effective embedded system architectural best practices. My name is Gili Kamar. I love technology and people. I have 20 years of experience in the software domain. I started as board designer. I wrote uh, drivers and boat loaders in C. I wrote multi-threaded application in C++. I also did some backend in C Sharp and Python. For the last year and a half, I'm the R&D manager at Blitz Motors. We are de developing electric scooters, and I'm responsible there on the software domain. Today, Spotlight, exploring best practices in embedded system with a focus on operating systems. And the takeaway from today, it's going to be practical tips for building better software, applicable not only to embedded system, but also to software in general. And first, I would like to start with two disclaimers. One, every rule presented here comes with an exception. Software isn't black and white. Second, the code snippet in, the, in this presentation are for illustration. I mean, slide wheel. And this is the agenda for today. It's pretty long, so let's start. First, operating systems. Operating systems, to be or not to be? So first, I would like to speak about hard soft real-time requirements. So in hard real-time, timing constraints are extremely strict. Something needs to happen every 10 microseconds. In soft, in soft real-time, timing is more flexible. Five to 10 milliseconds, it's fine. Sometimes a little bit more. In hard real-time, a guaranteed response time is a must. Something needs to happen every five microseconds. In soft, real, in soft real time, you need to respond, but it's okay, it will take a little bit more. In hard real time, we are speaking about resolution of microseconds. In soft real time, we are speaking about milliseconds. Flight control system is a good exa example to hard real time. Okay? You really need to do something every 10 microseconds. In soft real time, Home automation will be a good example, right? You want your light on, but it's okay. It will take another uh, 100 milliseconds. So the question we need uh, to ask ourselves, what level of time precision does our system require? 10 microseconds, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, and in general, less than 5 milliseconds, don't use an operating system. I don't say it's impossible, but it's not recommended. And the second question to ask about operating system is, how complicated our software is going to be? And in general, the more interfaces and processes we have, we would like to have an operating system. Let's try to fill this table. So when the system is simple and the requirements are hard real time, we are not, we shouldn't use an operating system. When system is complicated and the requirements are soft real time, then we should use operating system. System is simple and the requirements are soft real time, don't care, do what you prefer. The question is what we are doing when system is complicated, but the requirements are uh, hard real time. So in this case, we will use FPGA or a chip to handle the hard real-time requirements, and we will use CPU with operating system to do the rest, all the configuration, all the configuration and the logic and the processes and the communication. Let's review a system and decide if an operating system is needed. So this is my system. This is a communication unit. It's going to be installed on, on an electric scooter. And we have several interfaces. One of them is the canvas. And we, we are using it to speak with the engine and the dashboard. For example, we will read the speed from the engine, engine and we will pass it to the dashboard. So we could sh show the rider what its speed now. 
And we have also three UARTs. So one for logs, one for control with the PC. So we can upgrade the software and we can uh, set our configuration. And one UART for cellular modem unit. So we can send out, uh, we, can send, we can send to the cloud our data. For example, we can send the speed outside. And then in the database, we will have pairs of timestamp and speed. Okay, so in this case, we have four interfaces. I, it's probably not the most complicated system you saw, but this is enough complicated that we don't want to handle this in, in one context. And the second question, we need to ask ourselves, what level of time precision does the system require? In this case, I will say it's around 100 milliseconds because the speed is changing, but not so fast. So it's okay, it will uh, show to the rider 51 and then it will be uh, 52 after 100 milliseconds, right? So in this system, so in this case, we would like to use an operating system. This is another simple, much simpler, right? Only one interface. So we can use operating system, but we don't have to. So the takeaway from this chapter, use an operating system for a complex system with soft real-time requirements. Okay, next item, threads. And here I will start to describe a, a system that uh, will follow uh, my example. And this is a system I worked on uh, several years ago. Uh, the one in the middle was the product I worked on. And in one end, it listened to a lot of water meters that all the time uh, trans transmitted wirelessly uh, frames of data. And in the other end, it collected all the data and then created uh, messages and sent them to the backend. So it didn't collect all the data it received. It decided what is important and what is not. And, and, every, and once an hour, send the data out uh, using a, a cellular a modem, a modem. So it collects meter measurement from water meters in wireless and sends them to the cloud by cellular modem or Ethernet. And originally, it built to work with less than 1,000 meters. But in real life, it was expected to work with 7,500 meters. And in this case, loss of data means loss of money. And I had several problems about this product. We lost a lot of data in big sites. So if the site was, if we are in this site more than 5,000 meters, if it was a really big neighborhood, we just, we had, a, we had reset. We had a loss of data when there were network errors. And none of the errors were seen in the lab, of course. So here I will look at this problem that we had. Loss of data in big site when the site was very big. So I had unexplained reset and I couldn't understand why. And after some investigation, I found out that two threads tried to create large messages about five megabytes each at the same time. The second one always failed. I didn't have enough memory in my system. And it was a, a correlation between how many meters we are hearing to the size of the message. So in small sites, the message were smaller, so I didn't see this problem, only in big sites. So much fun. So what was the so solution? The solution was to change from asynchronic work to synchronic work. So instead in, uh, to do it in parallel, I just removed one of the thread, worked only in one in, with one thread that was responsible to prepare and send the first message, and then in a row, prepare and send the second message. So in general, keep the number of thread to the bare minimum. The most difficult bugs in a system are related to multiple threads running simultaneously. And let's see another good practice. Thread to each communication interface plus periodic thread. So this is the system, our system, remember? And, and this is the system when I draw it with, when the rectangles are thread and the cylinders uh, are cues. And let's look at this like this, so you will see it better. And first, uh, I, I would like to zoom in to the main thread, the periodic thread. And that's how it looks. So it runs periodically. And the first thing it, it does, it gets input sensors. And then it receives all messages. All the messages are waiting for, uh, for its 
in the queues. So you just go over all the queues and see if there, is, if there are messages there to handle them. And then when we have all the inputs inside, is do the process, do the logics, decide what it's supposed to do next, and then send all messages out, set all outputs, go to sleep to 100 milliseconds, and then after the sleep, wake up again and just do the same. And this is uh, very simple and very boring, but very, very robustic. Okay, now let's look at the uh, 3RX thread. Okay, uh, it's two UART and one canvas. So it's going to look like this. So we have thread or context that responsible on the low level. So each job is to collect, sit on the channel and collect all the bytes, create the message and put it to the queue. And then we have another thread, the general manager, we talk about it. That is just every periodic time, for example, 100 milliseconds, look inside the queue, see if there is something there, and if there is something there, it takes it out and handle it. So when we are choosing this architecture, we are not afraid to lose data, okay? Because we have a thread that all the time sit on the physical channel in one end. In the other end, we are also uh, not afraid not to come in time because the queue just save everything to us. So, we can, so then the general manager can come in its free time and, handle the, and, and process the messages. And now let's look at the four uh, TX thread. And this is similar to before, but, it, but the opposite side. So here the general manager create the message, put it to the queue, and then the TX thread looking all the time in the queue, see if there is something there, and if there is something there, it takes it out and, and send it. And the reason I prefer to do it like this, and not in the context of the general manager, is because I don't want to block the general manager because I have problem in network or, or other problems. So the takeaway, keep the number of thread to the bare minimum. Layer separation. Separate the logic layer from the hardware layer. We, we have big rectangle of embedded software, right? So I want to split it to two layers. One, application layer, and second, driver's handling layer. And the application layer is responsible on the processes and the logics, and the driver handling layer is responsible on the hardware. Let's look at this function, set traffic light. Very simple function. So the input is how many uh, how many people are waiting and seconds from green and the output is void. And if at least one person is waiting and it's more than 50 seconds since last time it was green, we are telling the hardware lead on green, otherwise lead on red. Okay, very simple function. So how are we going to test it? And even it's very simple function, it's a little bit pro problematic, right? Because of the mix between the logic and the hardware, so probably we are not. So let's see how, can, how we can test it. So first, let's separate it to logic and hardware. So this is the logic part. I created this function, get next traffic light. Okay, and the signature, the input is the same, but now we return traffic color, green or red. And the logic is exactly the same. How many, if at least one person is waiting, and it's more than 50 seconds since last time it was green, return green, otherwise red, okay? And this is pure logic. So now let's look at the original set traffic light. The same signature, but this is after refactoring. So the first line will be logic, and the second one will be hardware, okay? So here we, we see a good example of how to separate things. And now, when we have a pure logic, we can test it with unit test, right? So this is a, an example of simple unit test. Here I choose to have 10 people that are waiting and 50 seconds from green. And when I put it uh, to the function to get next traffic light, uh, I, I expect to get red. Why red? Because I choose to 50 seconds from green and not 51. And this is pretty simple without any mocking. And the, the reason I so like unit tests is because it encourages us to keep the code simpler, okay? So in general, try to mock as little as possible. 
every time you are mocking, probably it's me, it means that you didn't separate, it, separate enough. Okay? Most of the things, you can separate them, you, you can separate them, and then you don't need to mock. Almost at all. Okay, so till now we spoke about the high layer, right? Let's speak about the low layer. So this is a good example to API, to a driver, your interface. And this is how, as an application developer, I would like to see API for drivers, okay? I know there are a lot of registers there, uh, but, and a lot of options, but in the end there is the way I'm going to use the driver, and that's what I would like to see in 99% of them, okay? So first, I would like a very simple init. Second, a write that I can give, give it my buffer with how many bytes I have there, with the size, and it returns me true or false if it succeeds or not. And a read method that receives an empty buffer, and I also give it my maximum size to avoid overflow, and it returns how many byte, bytes have been read. And now let's look at this. This is shared memory interface. Very different driver, right? The physics is very different. But see, the API is almost the same, okay? Even that the physics is so different and also the, yeah, and also all the registers there. So how hardware tests should look like? Init, write, read, compare. And again, 99 of, no, 90% no, of the time, uh, you can test your drivers like this. So let's look at this, and this is very small. So let's zoom in. And here I am testing, a, this is a, a, a test a, for the shared memory test and not for the UART because the UART need an external loopback, okay? So this is easier. So first I prepare the data, then I'm calling in it, write, read, compare, and that's it. And if it's the same, I know that my test succeeds and I return true. And if not, I return false. And why it's so effective? Because we are testing customer interfaces. We are testing it exactly as our customer, the application developer, is going to use it. So if it's going to work on our, uh, on our desktop, it's also going to work on its desktop. And the second thing, it's giving a really good example how to use our driver, right? Because Okay, motivation for layer separation. It simplifies testing, it promotes cleaner, cleaner code, and it allows hardware driver replacement without application changes. So the takeaway from here, separate the logic layer from the hardware layer. Network problems. So this is my system from before, and that's the problem now that I'm going to speak about. Loss of data when there, were, when there were network errors, okay? A real problem I had. And it worked fine most of the time, but sometimes data was lost. The data prepared for transmission remained in the RAM awaiting to be sent. So what is the problem with that? The problem with that is that in case of no communication, it starts to aggregate and it starts to take a lot of space. And in some point, I didn't have enough, enough space, and I crashed. That was the first thing. The second thing, in case I got reset, and reset I can also get because I have a power failure, right? Even if I didn't do anything wrong, all the data was lost. And this is very painful. So what is the solution? The solution is to disconnect the logic from the network. So the first step to this, to split it to two threads one responsible to the logic. So this thread knows when to, when to collect the data, which data to collect, prepare the message, and put it to the queue. The second thread responsible for the sending. So it's very agnostic. Just look in the queue, see if there is something there, and if it see a message there, it takes it and send it away. And when it receives an acknowledge, it removes it from the queue. And if it doesn't receive an acknowledge, it doesn't do anything. Just Again, you just look inside the queue, see if you see something, if there is something there, you send it again. And that's it, and just continue, continuously doing this. And the second step is using SQLite. 
It's a light database in the SD card. So instead of implementing the queue in my RAM, I implemented it in the SD card. And there I have a lot of space. So what was achieved by this implementation? One, maximum data loss is now limited because every hour I take the data and put it in a database. Two, I'm not being sensitive anymore to network errors because I'm deleting data from my database only when I receive an acknowledge. So even if every day for 23 hours I'm not going to have a network and only one hour with network is going to work and I'm not going to, to lose a thing. This is another example. This is a real uh, snapshot from a database from my work. And uh, we have uh, an IoT that all the time, every 30 seconds, more or less, uh, collect uh, data and, and sending it out. And uh, in the left column, we see the, the timestamp that it received in the database. And in the right columns, uh, we see the, the timestamp when uh, the message was created. So let's look at this. So here we see that the message was created at 6.37, and it was received at 6.39, and that's okay, sometimes IoT uh, devices, it takes them some time to send. Let's continue. Here we see a gap of, uh, of almost five to six minutes, okay? And this gap is because we have not network error. So we see that the message now is created at 6.43. So we have a jump from 6.37 to 6.43. Let's continue. And here, this is weird, right? Because now we are jumping back to 6.37. And now we are jumping again to 6.44, okay? And this is a real database, okay? And, and you can ask, okay, so what is the problem with that? Messages are not in order. Okay, we got it, but what do you want? It's hard to put logic on the receive side. And second, it's confusing, and it's very easy to miss without noticing. So how to avoid it? Use one queue to send that out from a specific interface, okay? What they did probably, they have their own contents that they try to send that out, and they have another queue when they have problems in the network, and also they try to send data from there. So use one queue, and then the FIFO is kept. The takeaway, disconnect the logic from the network. External interfaces. Design your protocol and messages in a way you could always bounce back from a bad message. So we have one embedded unit, and we have another embedded unit, and they speak between themselves in I2C or SPI or Canvas or Ethernet or UART. And it probably looks like this. Box A uh, sends status request to box B, and box B responds with status message. And then box A send lo logs request to box B, and box B respond with log messages. And depending on your low level, it's going to be either a stream or a packet, right? Or it's going to receive a, byte of, a stream of bytes, or maybe you are lucky and someone already did this job for you and split it to messages. And there are some potential problems when we are uh, working with streaming. So maybe everything is good and we can just split it to messages and everything is good. But maybe in the start we are receiving only half message. Maybe the beginning till the middle or the middle till the end. And we need to be able to identify it and drop it and to be able to align to the next message. And this is another uh, uh, example. Maybe we receive a good message and then we have some junk, okay, because there is some collision or some noise. Uh, we are not controlling what someone else is sending to us, right? And then we are receiving a good message. Again, we need to be able to identify it and to drop it and to align to the next message. And this is another example. Message, uh, me message two, it's, it's complete and it's in the right size, but something there in the content is not correct. Maybe one of the bits is flipped from one to zero or zero to one. So recommended message structure we look like this. So we have the header. This is the metada metadata of the message. We have the message body. This is the content itself. And we have a CLC, so we could use it to, 
to verify that the content of the message is correct. And let's look, let's do a zoom in. So in the header, we have a prefix. It's going to be four characters that, uh, with a, a const value, so we can identify them in the memory. And then we just go over the, over the stream and identify the start of the message. And then we read how many bytes we have in this message. And then we can calculate the CRC and compare it to the value in the end. And if it's the same, good, we have a full message and we can continue parsing it. But, it, but if it's not good, we don't need to drop everything. All what we need to do is drop the prefix and start again to search for a new prefix. And then just start again this process. Let's look inside how the header is built. So I, I've already spoke about the, the, the prefix. And it's also nice if it's in ASCII, so it's easy to identify in the memory. And here, how many lengths we have in the message. And version. Version is important because maybe in the future you will want to change your protocol, right? So you need to be able to pass different protocols. This is your way to do it, especially in embedded, because you are going to have a lot of units spread all over the world. They're probably not going to, not going to be updated exactly at the same time. And this is the type of the opcode, okay? This is our key, how, how we are going to pass this message. It is a status message, configuration message, management message. Okay, so till now it was mandatory. Now it's nice to have. So this is ID, a unique ID. So every message will have a unique ID. It's going to be running counter. One, two, three, four, and, and so on. But if you are sending the same message twice, put the same ID. Okay, so it identify the uniqueness of the message. So the receive side could identify, this is the second time it received this message, so it, uh, it can drop it. And another thing is the sequence. It's similar to the ID, but not exactly. Every message will have a, a different sequence. This is also an encounter. One, two, three, four, and so on. And the reason we are doing this is for us to understand better what is happening in the system, okay? So we will put logic in the receive side. So even if you are sending the same message twice, the sequence will be different. And then in the receive side, we will put logic and check this, uh, and check this sequence all the time. And if we have a jump, it means that we lost the message. So we don't have anything to do about this in the receive side, but we can write it to a log. And then for us, we can just look at the logs after a week or a two or a month and verify we are not missing messages at all in the system. And if we miss the messages, and sometimes, or maybe we are doing something wrong, right? So we can fix it. But sometimes we don't have control on this because it's, we have collision and it's wireless and, and there is a lot of noise. So in this case, maybe uh, we should uh, put a check that is strong. Maybe we should uh, choose redundancy and send message more than one. And this is the structure of the message itself. So in the beginning, we have the header. This is the body itself. And here I, I was very original, temp one, temp two, temp three. And the body structure can be several things. It can be proprietary protocol, as the protocol I show you, or it can be protobuf, or cbor, or json, or yaml, depends on your needs. And here we have the CRC. So the takeaway, design your protocol and messages in a way you could always bounce back from a bad message. Simulators. Okay, when, I, uh, when I'm speaking about simulator, you probably think about something like this and you're asking, asking yourself, what does she want from us, right? We are embedded developers, we don't like GUI, we don't like front-end, it's boring, right? But not necessarily. And not necessarily all simulator needs such a compl complicated GUI. The simulator allows us to replicate scenarios that would be difficult to test in real life otherwise. And the two types of simulators are interfaces simulator, when you want to test our interfaces before the integration or because the other group even didn't start to develop their side. And, and the load simulator, okay? In load simulator, we're putting a lot of stress on the system, and we want to see how it behaves. 
what are the bottlenecks? What, what uh, it's our boundaries? And here I'm going to talk about two simulators that are lot simulators. I really like them. And uh, this is, uh, these two simulators are from real life for the last several years. So this is the first one. And remember this system? So when I tried to, de uh, uh, to develop this system, I had a question. I needed to verify that my CPU supports 200, 200 canvas message per second. It was my first time I worked with this CPU. It was my first time I worked with canvas. So I wasn't sure it was supposed to work, okay? So I wanted to test it before, uh, before we are starting the development. So really in the early stage. So that's what we did. The simulator, he had two threads. In one thread, he all the time sent messages to the embedded CPU to a specific opcode with increasing, uh, with increasing counter, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And the CPU just did a loopback. So he received this message in this specific opcode, and he said, okay, I received this message, good. I will send another message with a different opcode, but exactly with the same content. So if it received in the content one, it received one, it, it returns one. If it received two, it returns two, and so on. And the second thread in the simulator uh, received all the messages, uh, received all the messages and verified that uh, the numbers there increased all the time, okay? And that was the GUI. Uh, it was written in C sharp. And here we see the message ID. And here, how many messages we want to send every second. This is the start button. And this is some statistics about how many messages in total we are sending and how many messages we are sending per second. And this is the log. So if something is wrong or we are missing messages, we're supposed to, be, to see it here. So the simulator sends X messages per second and verifies that it's received all of them back. So I started with 10 messages and it worked fine, and then 100 messages and it worked fine. And all the time I increased the number and it worked fine till at 850 messages per second. Then it stopped working. The PC wasn't strong enough. The PC didn't have enough resources, okay? So it stopped working, not because of the CPU, but because of the PC. So in this point, I was uh, pretty happy. So from my point of view, the embedded CPU passed the test and it's strong enough to do what it's supposed to do. Now simulator two. And this is even better because it is, it is without GUI at all. So remember this problem I had, loss of data in big sites? And you remember also the end of the story, right? About that I found out that I have a, a two, a two threads that try to, uh, to allocate mem uh, big messages in parallel and I didn't have enough space, right? But this was the end of the story. This was the start of the story. I had this problem, problem and customer complained all the time. And of course, in our uh, office, everything worked very good. And the first thing I did, it was, of course, to blame the hardware, right? We are embedded developers, so the first one to blame is the hardware. And uh, then uh, they brought me to the office, uh, the hardware, and it worked uh, fine. So in this point, I understood this is not a hardware problem, but software problem. And my problem was how I'm going to re reproduce the problem. Okay, because everything worked in my office. And I had around me around 300 meters, and it's a lot, okay? But still, the system, system worked very well with 300 meters. So that was the question, how to simulate 5K plus meters? So what I did, for every data frame meter that I received, I created 10 to 50 fake data frames in software. And I succeeded. The unit crashed on my table when I simulated 6K meters and put art configuration. What does it mean, art configuration? If the ordinary, the standard configuration is the, uh, sending message once an hour, I didn't have enough patience to wait one hour, right? So instead of it, every two minutes, I, I uh, sent messages. So I changed the, the value instead of every one hour to every two minutes. Uh, to hope that uh, I will see the problem more often. And it succeeded. I succeeded to reproduce the problem every time 
I, I, I simulated uh, 6K meters. And from this point, it was easy to find the problem, okay? Because I could use my debugger and put the breakpoint and look at the call stack and see exactly what is happening. So let's uh, see how I did it. So this is the message, opcode and ID and value. And, and this is the received thread of the unit. And here, this is the first change I did. So I put a line that is checking if I have a, my, file, my file is over there. So the, it was a Linux system. So I created the file manually and put it there. And here I'm checking if this file exists. And if it exists, I know uh, I want the simulator to be, to be on. And I'm getting in. And here I receive message, it's a blocking message. So we are waiting to real message to arrive. And when real message is arrived, the message uh, will uh, fulfill with the content and it returns true. So we are getting in and then we are pushing the real message to the queue. And now we are asking if we are in simulator mode. And if we are in simulator mode, we are getting in, we are getting in and we, now we are, I've just duplicate the original message and here I'm modified the ID. Why I modify the ID here? It's because I want to trick my system. I want my system to think this is a, a data from a new meter, a different meter, or a fake meter in our case. So here I'm changing this ID and push it to the queue, to the same queue as the original one. And then just keep doing it for 100 times. Or it could be different number, depends on your system. So I took a real message and created from it 100 fake messages, okay? So instead of one message from one meter, now my system think it has another one, uh, 100 meters. So this is all the function, and this is all the changes I did in the code. See, it's not so much, not so many, right? And this is without any change of hardware. So what are the benefits? No need for special hardware. Short development time, you see it, 10 lines in the code, that's it. Easy access to simulator mode without additional building, because if the file there or not. And it can be, and it can be used as a release test before launching a new version. And that's the way I used it. So, my system start when it was supposed to support only 1,000 meters, but they expected to support much more, and it was crashed with 5,000 meters. Thanks to this simulator, I, I, uh, I use it to improve uh, my software, and after a year, uh, the product was, was able to support uh, 10K uh, meters. So I almost, uh, I doubled performance, okay? without any change in the hardware, only software. So the takeaway, use simulators, logs. Okay, everyone has logs, I guess. It looks something like this. Let's uh, look about some tips regarding it. So first, add timestamp with milliseconds. It sounds silly, but the default is second, and I saw so many logs with sec second, huh? I see your faces. And let's see why it's important to work with milliseconds. Here, every arrow is an event. So here we have eight events between 06 to 07. And, and this is very different from what we saw before, right? Here, if I have a problem, I will say, mm, maybe it's too close. Maybe I need to spread it a little bit. But I cannot see it from the logs. It looks exactly the same, right? All of them will, will get the tag of 06. This is another scenario. Two is after one, but sometimes you have some, uh, some race there, and maybe it will, be opposite, it, it will be converted. And again, we cannot see it when the timestamp is exactly the same. Another example, we have two events. Let's assume the gap between them is only two milliseconds. But in the log, one of them will be 06, one of them will, will be 07. So when we look at the logs, it will be one second gap between them. And it, this is a very different scenario. Second thing, add metadata, log level, file, file, line, and thread. So 
the log level is important because you want the ability to filter it later. And the file and the line, okay? So we will know from where, uh, from there where the log is. And before you are telling me that all your logs are unique in the system, just think about it that one day a developer will come and will do a copy paste in your code, and that's it. Your log is not unique anymore. And thread ID, super important when you are working with thread. Use the same log configuration in all sites. We all know that logs are, influence, are influencing timing, and that's exactly the reason why we want to test exactly what we are going to deliver to our customer, okay? This is the first reason. The second reason that you are debugging yourself and testing yourself and doing the QA in one setup. So you are used to, to look at your logs. And then if you have a different set, setup at your customer and you have problem there, you will just look in the logs and say, okay, I don't have enough information. Okay, so you should use exactly the same log configuration. And if you have too many logs, reduce them. Keep number of logs to the bare minimum. It's like warnings when you have a lot, it's hard to see anything, okay? So I understand you are developing something, uh, you are developing a new feature and you need a lot of logs. That's fine, put a lot of logs. But then you complete your feature. And after a month, or a week or a month, if everything is stable, clean after yourself, okay? Write logs with details. This also sounds very trivial, but let's look at this. This is very standard uh, log. Temperature rising, check sensors. To which temperature, okay? We are developers, not, uh, not writers. So you don't write only text. You are doing something wrong if in your log, everything is text, write numbers. Tell us why you, why you decide this is supposed to be in the log. Another example, device firmware updated. To which version? from which version, put details inside. Prepare your logs to automatic monitoring. I don't want to see four logs, four line of logs for one event because it's easy to your eyes to look at it, okay? Put it in one line with all the values you need, okay? So later uh, it will be easier to do automatic monitoring. So the takeaway, Milliseconds, metadata, same configuration, bare minimum, we details, prepare for automation. And now monitoring. Identify errors proactively. Don't wait for customer complaints. It's our job as developers to find our problems, errors, bugs, first, before the customer. We are doing it by debugging and testing before we are releasing a new version. And we're supposed to continuously doing it after the release by monitoring, okay? It's our job. And second thing, if it's not automated, it won't get done. Okay, so you have one unit with one log. So you go over the log. You are a nice developer, right? But then you have two units with two logs. And now it's like, hmm, depends how much time you have, but what you are doing when you have 10 units and 100 units, 1,000 units, how are you going to go over their logs? And I'm speaking here on logs, and maybe you have also other mechanism of statics, statistics, statistics or uh, other information, so of course you can use it also. I'm speaking on logs because in most of the system I know there are logs, and in most of the system, especially in embedded, they are not monitored. So first, at the first step, write a Python script. Start with the errors. So this is a very uh, simple Python script. And the output will be these two lines from the log we saw before. Yeah, we see the errors, that's what we are catching. And what I want you to do that after you are uh, writing the script and say it's working, every day with your coffee in the morning, you are running your script and get a list of error. And then there are three options for each error. One, you did something wrong, you have a bug. So you need to fix it, so now you can fix it. So tomorrow morning, this line is not going to be there. Two, 
something is not, something is wrong in the system, okay? Something is expired or not connected, okay? So you can fix it or you can notify someone else to fix it. So tomorrow morning, this line is not going to be there. And the third option, you will tell me, mm, it's not exactly an error, it fixed, it sometimes happened. And if it's not a real error, so it shouldn't be an error. So put it in an info. Error is something you need, you need actively to do something regarding it. If you, you don't need to do anything active regarding this, it's not an error. And if you just keep doing this, so after a week or two, your list is going to be empty. Now, after you, you did this, monitor periodic activity, activities. So if you're doing something periodically in your system, for example, uh, send data every hour, it's very hard to follow it, right? Because you're looking in your logs while you are developing it, but what happens after that? So take it from the logs, put it to a, CS file, uh, to a CSV file, look it in the Excel, and then you have two columns, one with timestamp and one with the event. And now you can calculate the gaps or you can uh, plot it and see that the behavior is the behavior you want it to have. And now let's continue. Uh, now start to count interesting events and create summary for each unit. So it will look something like this. So what is the serial number and the firmware and how many errors and less time it has been seen and data sending events and maximum temperature and everything else that is interesting in, in your domain. And now it's much nicer because instead of going over the logs, it takes a lot of time. But now you have only one line to go over and see that everything is, is good. And if not, you can, of course, uh, you can dive in to the logs. But if everything is good, great. And now when you did it to one unit, you can do it to more unit, right? So it, it's going to look like this. And then it's easy to see that something is wrong. For example, here we have 87 in the errors and all the rest is zero. So we know something is wrong and we should dive into the logs to understand what's it wrong. Or maybe the version is not updated, so we, we need to update it or tell someone else that it should be upgraded. It gives us a really good overview of what's happening with our units. So the takeaway, if it's not automated, it won't get done. So we are in the end of the talk, and this is the summary. We talked about a lot of things, so I will just remind you on what we spoke. Use an operating system for complex system with soft real-time requirements. Keep number of thread to the bare minimum. Separate logic layer from hardware layer. Disconnect the logic from the network. Design your protocol in a way you could always bounce back from a bad message. Logs, put timestamp with milliseconds. Work with simulators. And if it's not automated, it won't get done. Thank you very much. Any question? Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a note and a question. So we know about uh, traffic light examples where you have a layer separation between the hardware abstraction layer and the logic layer. Yes. So I would argue that mocking is not really necessary because you can test the logic with unit test, but when you mock your hardware abstraction interface, you can still test that you call your hardware abstraction layer correctly. So I would think that's still a useful thing to have. I think it's, it really depends what you want to test. I am looking yeah, at this That from... particular example of a traffic light that you call um, the interface correctly, that you pass the correct Yeah, here, again, it depends where you are putting your layers. You are speaking about that you have another layers in the middle. Yeah. Okay? So I think it's better when you separate it to different blocks. So every block, you have the interface of this block. For, so from the point of the uh, application, I just want to test still the API. Okay? And then what you say that the low level, it's also split into two layers. Okay? So you have the API to some layer, and then you have some registers layer, okay? Yeah. So it depends what you want to talk. And in my talk, I spoke about really the low layer, and then I spoke about the high layer, and I agree with you, there is another layer there. But again, I, I look on, uh, about it, um, especially from the eyes from the application developer, okay? 
again, maybe there are so some situation, it's not black and white. Yeah. That's exactly what I said. There are, probably there are some situation you need to mock. But I just said that most of the places I saw mocking and I saw it a lot in, in software, even in backend software, okay? So no hardware and still they're doing a lot of mocking. Yeah, and the question about the, um, the monitoring, do you yeah, do I, monitoring on the device itself or you send logs? Um, I just looking at the logs. No, I mean the logs are stored on the device or you send them out to do monitoring? The, there the are two options, uh, depends on your system. Okay. Uh, there are two options. Uh, again, in, the, in, in embedded device, you are not always connected. Right, okay? that, that's, that's what the question is, yeah. how you do that. Okay, so there are several things, to, uh, ways to do it. One thing, uh, you have, uh, in most of the places, you have some unit you are running with them. And in most of the places I saw, no one monitoring them. They're just running and no one looking at the results, right? Someone is very happy because they're running and they say, hey, yeah, we are testing it all the time. But we are not looking at the result. So even if you will just take your unit in the office and monitor them, and you have access to them, right? And you monitor them, your software is going to be better. Okay, and when it's a, a unit that um, embedded unit, so there are two options. Maybe it's connected in some way. Most of the units today of the embedded unit are connected in, in, to the backend. And then you can send maybe even only interesting events. So you're not going to send everything. So you have your own development log and you have some events you are sending out. So, and it's very common that you are sending a, a important events and errors, for example. So you can monitor what you are sending uh, for the backend. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, generally, generally, general, I spoke in my um, in my talk on system with operating system. It can be with Linux. It can be free to, uh, uh, free autos. It can be micro C. It can be uh, a lot of VX works. I can continue. There are a lot of operating system, but not necessarily. Uh, but I think most of my talk, uh, yeah, was focused on. A system with operating system, but not necessarily Linux. The system I'm working uh, today is uh, the, uh, the communication unit. It's free autos, for example. So when you store your logs um, on an SD card, do you use like, a particular stack for that? And if you experience any kind of like tiny issues with that too? You know, with, with the logs? The database that you put on the SD card. You mentioned SQL database on yes. the SD card, I think is what is being asked about. Um, do you have any timing issues with that? Is that the question? Oh, you're back. You got yeah. here. Yeah, so. Um, so your messages, you said you were saving them to like a SQLite database yes. in one of these instances. Um, when you were doing that, did you see any kind of like issue with, I don't know if you were using like an off the shelf stack to Interface with, for one, the SD card, and then have I, I use something standard. Okay. It already was implemented. I just try to use it this way. Right. I um, use it in different way. And in this case, I didn't have a problem of timing because I send a message uh, once an hour. So I saved one message to 10 messages every hour. So I don't care. It took some time. So it took another extra milliseconds or and other several messages, messages I, I wasn't, uh, yeah. All right, thank you, great talk. Thank you. Question, um, do you do field updates on these embedded devices? And if so, do you have a favorite mechanism for that? Uh, it's always a problem yeah. to, upgrade the, to upgrade the embedded. Um, today, I think it's very common to have uh, all this photo mechanism right, over the air, uh, updating. Um, it's, uh, let's say that I uh, saw it in a lot of places and always, uh, and it's always a, a, unique, a unique solution. Yeah. It's not something that you just can take from the shelf and it's worked, unfortunately. So in every place I worked, we, we had a different mechanism. You always start with something that is serial, mm -hmm. most of the times, and then you just use what the provider of the CPU gives you, 
Mm-hmm. Most of the time you use its mechanism. And then at some point it's not good enough because you need something else. And then you need to invent your own mechanism and uh, update the, the bootloader to support it and write yourself uh, yeah, a software uh, to do this burning. Uh, and the same thing exactly when you are trans- transferring it wirelessly. In general, when you are uh, updating software, uh, there are two things that need to be done. One, you need to transfer the file inside. This is the first thing. And the second, you need, uh, you need to be able to take this, uh, after it's inside, to take this file and put it in the right place in your flesh. Yep. So this is two separated things. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and it's, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't see something that you can say, okay, I, I always uh, doing this. It's always a different solution. Um, and another question, uh, you definitely hit on uh, data integrity in your communications, but did, do you have no? Did you have concerns about um, security at all, or encryption, or is that uh, not, not concerning I didn't, your I didn't, system? I didn't touch the subject, but it's very. Uh, let's say that it's very common to encrypt also the data. Mm-hmm. One of the things you are doing after your building, I just here I just treated how we are going uh, to parse it and to verify we are not missing any data and we are not influenced of uh, noise and things like this. But it's very common also to to encrypt the data. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of tall. Sorry. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about your process when you run into an error or a particular issue and you decide debugging would be the way to go? Okay. Uh, what would be your general uh, framework or process as far okay. as how you would approach that? The, gen- the first thing I'm doing when I see a bug is try to reproduce it. This is the first thing. Before you are reproducing a bug, you cannot solve it. No matter what do you think about the bug, okay? Uh, and when you rep- succeed to reproduce the bug, so you are 95% almost there in, in solving it. So the first thing is try to reproduce it. So um, the first thing to do is uh, go to the someone who complains about this bug and look if he does something that is uh, different or special Maybe it, it operated in a way you didn't think about it even, okay? And of, of course, look in the logs and try to figure out what is happening and try to, to think and also touch in your, in, like in a white box, touch in your software to see how can you um, create exactly the same logs, okay? What need to be happen in the system so it will be uh, behaved the way it behaved? If it, if it sounds crazy to you, say, oh, it's not possible. So everything possible, right? You have a bug. You have a proof you had a bug. So something that you think is not correct. So you just need to open yourself. And, and I think this is the hard work to reproduce the bug. Once you reproduce the bug, the bug is solved. So uh, say you have some sort of system limitation and you're not able to uh, reproduce the bug. I mean, I know in my experience, I've had to, uh, I've come across issues like that. And then um, I'd have to, uh, remove a component or reduce a requirement? Is that something that you've typically done or is there a different approach? No, the, the, the approach is write simulator. That's exactly why we are using simulator mm-hmm. because, because it's not something, it's easy to us to simulate in the real life. For example, error scenarios, right? We are always right for error scenarios, but it's hard for us to test, to test this, right? Because errors, it's very rare happen, especially when it's in your office, okay? It's happened only in your customer sites. So that's exactly why you are developing simulators, okay? Uh, to help you to go in all the paths. It's not uh, in your daily, you are not go over there. So try to, again, everything, it's like plastiline. You can do everything you want. Mm-hmm. So you need to understand, you, again, you need to try to simulate again the same behavior. Okay, and it's hard to do it without simulators. Understood, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any more questions? Okay, so we are done. Thank you very much.